Socialists teaming up to bring their message to the heartland. Senator Bernie Sanders is hitting the campaign trail in Kansas with the new face of big government liberalism. You know, we must have gotten off at the wrong stop because people told me that Kansas was a Republican state. Does it look like that today? We are going to come together to transform this country politically and economically. We want to be a nation that, that allows improved and expanded Medicare for all. We are a nation that will not stop until every child is born with the opportunity to go to college or trade school free of cost. Meanwhile, Senator Elizabeth Warren is pushing the left's new fake news narrative about jobs. When people are working at minimum wage jobs that won't support them or they're working two, three or four jobs to try to pay the rent and keep food on the table, then simply saying the unemployment figures have gone down just doesn't get you there. What she forgot to mention is that the Trump economy is booming and there are more jobs available than people to fill them. All right, Greg, let's start with uh, Cortez teaming up with Bernie. I love it. I mean, this is a big threat to the Democrat establishment. It's like you got the old communists, you got the new communists. It's like the Snoopy and Woodstock <laughs> of socialism. Think about it. The greatest economic system known to mankind is the one that the Democratic Party is rejecting, despite evidence that it's worked to eliminate poverty and disease all over the world, wherever it's introduced. And yet they pick the one that wherever it's introduced destroys Countries, Venezuela, uh, Cuba, USSR before it became Russia, even, even cities in California, San Francisco, uh, because I would say because of big government is now the nation's restroom. You can have a seat anywhere, no flushing needed. So I think, uh, I think uh, go for it all the way. I, and also, I think they'd make, they're, they're a great team. They're like, a, they're like a buddy cop show. They're like a buddy cop socialist show. They do look good together, I have to admit. Juan, socialists aren't very good at math. Let's just be honest. I mean, she wants free college, free housing, free health care. Who is going to pay for all this? Oh, gee, I wonder. Maybe it's the same people who are paying for the Trump tax cut that blew up the deficit. You think that could be just oh, all funded by crumbs? Oh, that crumb? that's it. So in other words, it's OK when Trump blows up the deficit and spends a lot of money. But if you start taking care of us, the American people, and most Americans think we need some kind of Affordable Care Act, we should take care of people who have pre-existing conditions. I thought conditions. we had an affordable care. Affordable. Oh, who's who's, affordable who's care. trying to undo it? it? Oh, it's your side. It's your side. It's unaffordable very affordable. Care. By the yeah. way, Greg, we're not talking about communism. Is that what you said? Communism? I will say they're communists. Okay. Socialist communists. You call, you know, tomato, yeah. tomato. Well, I see. But what about the idea that we in the United States are a country that, in fact, puts in place taxes. We somewhat restrain unfettered capitalism because guess what you know there's sometimes the need for a safety net well bernie sanders style socialism is communism let's not forget that he's the one who used to praise bread lines uh, in south america as an example of how government is actually working for the people as people are starving standing in line waiting for the little crumb literally that the government is going to give them i love that elizabeth warren is trying to argue that you know people are trying to work three or four jobs just to earn a living when Democrats and socialists in their party have made it impossible for regular everyday Americans to make a living by implementing minimum wage laws which have now turned places like McDonald's where people get their first step in into robotic institutions where you order from a machine rather than a teenager who can then go on and, and get a good job in life. They are also the, the same party who has implemented things like occupational licensing. You have to have a permit to be uh, you know, a child care specialist. You have to have a permit to uh, you know, pluck someone's eyebrows. They are the ones who make it impossible for people to actually go outside of the system and make the money that they want to make on their own. So in terms of regulation, Elizabeth Warren and the socialists are the ones who actually put workers down in this country and want to implement a socialist system that is bad for all of us. And by the way, this Medicare for all plan is not affordable, Juan. It's going to cost $32 trillion. I see. And what did it cost? To, what did it cost when they said, you know, too big to fail. We better bail out Wall Street. I think at that, that has point, nothing to do with what I'm talking that's about. exactly what we're talking no, about. You said it's too expensive to take care of Americans I, who are I'm ill, and I don't think that's free, the case. I'm saying nothing is free, and I want to take care of myself and my that's own fine. family rather than everybody else. I do yeah, know, I do know Juan, that we want eyebrow pluckers to be able to pluck <laughs> without... Saying. 
Uh, by the way, regulations. Jesse, you yes. obviously didn't get your eyebrow. <laughs> you Those are bushier than. Uh, I know, I know. We need, we need uh, definitely some pluckers on set. Uh, Molly, what do you think about Elizabeth so Warren though, trying not to get outflanked by Cortez? Now it's not just two jobs people are working; they're now working four jobs. And soon it'll be sixteen jobs 16 that people jobs. are working, and that explains the low unemployment rate. Right. But I really do think Democrats have a problem. All the excitement that they have is on this left side, this left flank, and you're learning, you're hearing about people wanting Medicare for all, never mind that that's not going to actually happen. I mean, Vermont, California, Maryland all had to abandon their Medicare for all programs because they were too expensive. And so will they still retain that excitement when things that they're pushing for don't happen? They had the vote this week to abolish ICE and that didn't happen. So I'm not sure how to maintain that excitement that's uh, there on the base. That happen? Uh, I think it was Republicans pulled the bill. Oh, because Democrats voted, uh, they voted, they voted president on the bill or against it. But the point being, it's not very popular on a national level. It's very popular uh, in, in New York City, maybe, or Vermont. But are these the kind of messages that will actually pull nationally or will they cause a lot of problems? And you mentioned the crowd size because it looks like a lot of people turned out for this, Greg. And we spoke yesterday about Biden running. I don't right. think Biden can turn out a crowd the way a Bernie Sanders could. Well, it's tough because if you, I mean, if you eliminate the big names or the wild cars or the charismatic people that the, they're versions of Trump. So you think about like Oprah's not going to run, Michelle Obama's not going to run and Hillary, which I think would be the perfect rematch because I think that's a big story, but she probably won't. You're left with a remainder's table at a drugstore. You know that <laughs> discount table where you have like a travel shampoo and you have a deck of cards <laughs> and you have a bottle of cough syrup that's past the expiration right date. Right at the checkout line. Yeah, it's right at the right checkout the line end. and it's like if you're drunk you might buy something. That's the Democratic <laughs> candidate. That's that's what they're going to have right now. They're, and it's not, I don't think the reality is, I don't think you're going to see the candidate until 2019. But I do think it's interesting that they are campaigning in deeply red states. Kansas was won by President Trump in 2016 by 20 points. However, as we have learned through special elections in the past a year politically, you can't take any seat for granted and every single vote counts. And let's not forget that a number of Bernie Sanders supporters then became Trump supporters. So mm -hmm. they are targeting a certain sector of those voters, even in deep red districts, because they feel like you work at it, you can do it. Cortez is the one who won the election because her opponent uh, wouldn't show up to the debates and wouldn't actually put so in Katie, the work to win the election. Katie, Katie, so they're not taking it for granted. Katie, let's celebrate this moment. We agree on something. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Agreement really with Juan Williams. We really do. Because I think a lot, and I think Greg's in on this too, yeah. that a lot of the Bernie supporters on the far left actually are populist and very closely aligned with people who are Trump supporters yeah. on the far right. But I would say this, and, and, and to disagree with you, to keep our show going. <laughs> of course. Uh, <laughs> I would say that if you look at uh, something like the tax cut, the Trump tax cut. The idea was that that was going to be the big Republican message for the midterms. It has become a dud. But it doesn't why? work. And why doesn't it work? Because Americans say it hasn't this raised their wages. Why is going for it's a put tax more cut in the pocket in the fall, Juan? Yeah, because he's trying to fix it, Jesse. No, he no, realizes no, no, no. this thing clear. is a dud. And they're trying hurt. to cement it right no, on the eve of the, the midterm people, elections. That tells me they think it's working. No, One because the tried. people, hang on a second, the people in Kansas that you saw Sanders and Oct Octavia Cortez speaking to, are people who are saying, you know what, this hasn't worked for us. We we put some faith in Trump. They put faith, in fact, their oh, former so governor. Those were all and Trump supporters yeah. that showed no, up. I think there are a lot of the populists. A lot of the populists. I think there are a lot of populists. And this drove the president crazy when the tax cuts were being implemented. It wasn't just a tax cut. It was a tax cut and jobs plan. So you can talk all about all how you want about the tax cuts, but the jobs portion of this has been really important and much of the time ignored. But the economy think, is so booming. Is there it? are more jobs now than we can actually fill due well, to a skills gap. Oh, yeah. It's funny so though, you, we've, we've it's spent, all about jobs and the tax cuts. We spent an entire week screaming about how an outside foreign power is taking over this country when actually the call, the phone call is coming from inside the house. Uh, you have a party that's adopting policies of, hist of the history's worst disasters and you have non-citizens who can now vote. Uh, yeah, can you what, believe that? Which, in San is, which, is, inter, it, which is an interesting again to in bring up. In your city. In my in city. Your city. I am ashamed <laughs> of San Francisco. More about the poop problem than the non citizens voting because I, I like to walk without having to step in anything. Molly. But, uh, but that really is the real lesson of liberal yeah. governance. I mean, San Francisco is a great city that has had mm. so much. Uh, this is like the place where more money has been earned than anywhere yeah. else in the country. And what do they have to show for it? This yeah. horrible homeless problem. Right. And all of the money in the world isn't saving it. So there really is 
an issue where liberal governance is not attracting as much as conservative. I wonder if we could turn the camera to San Francisco and see all the fabulously rich people who are dying to buy a place because it's so expensive. It's, it, no, I agree. Oh. No, you're right, it, it, it you're right, one. Yeah. And the thing, and the mayor, the new mayor, uh, um, admitted that there is a problem, and they asked what the solution is, and it was like, well, we'll, we'll we're just going to talk to people. <laughs> we're going to talk to people because that's going to get people off the streets and off doing drugs and what. But here's and, the thing that really I think supports your argument, which is that they spend, I think it's thirty-seven thousand, yeah, on trying to deal with the homeless. But per you and homeless person, person. Right. and per you person. and I have argued about deinstitutionalization, right. which didn't come from the Democrats, by the way. But the whole the with them, homelessness, but then the agreed. homelessness problem, and the problem of people with, you know, post-traumatic stress syndrome, or somehow they're destabilized, somehow men maybe men mentally incapacitated, is a big problem nationwide. But the big cities, especially the affluent big cities and affluent states that are more democratic, more compassionate, if you will, in oh, terms of trying to take care. On, they get on. besieged, and then you say, oh, these places are out of control. But Juan, what does it tell That's you not about your governing philosophy? When you have a statistic, $37,000 of taxpayer money spent per homeless person, yet the homeless crisis is raging in San Francisco. We had a similar statistic in Baltimore. They spend more money per pupil in the school districts in Baltimore than like almost any other city in this country, and they have the worst test scores. Yeah. Maybe spending a lot of money and throwing money at the problem doesn't always help. Well, I don't, well, in one, let me just say, you and I happen to agree on things like, uh, you know, vouchers and charter schools and innovative ways to try to create better educational opportunities for I children. I think we're changing cities. Juan's position. But He's going to become but, a Trump voter. But I got to <laughs> tell you, on the homeless one, we still yes. disagree, Jesse, because I don't think that we want to be Brazil and have homeless people in the street and say, well, that's what that's it is. Yeah. Have you seen the tent cities <laughs> no, no, in LA? No, 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 we were talking about the idea. You spend money, you try to do something great. But it comes down to these liberal governments in Detroit, uh, San Francisco, LA, Washington, DC, punishing success in order to try and fix a problem that they have created punishing by punishing that success. How are you punished? I don't, I'm not, a, you know, they're, they're punishing success by oh, punishing businesses. Others. Like the tax in Seattle they wanted to put on for each employee that they had, yeah. they were going to charge $100 or something to take care of the homeless problem problem you're punishing successful people to take care of liberal problems and as we've seen that play out across the country all right president trump defends his meeting with putin and you won't believe what he's calling barack obama when we return Happy Friday, folks, but in the aftermath of the Putin summit fallout, hmm, President Trump, he's not too happy. He's slamming President Obama for how he handled Russia while Obama was in the White House. Nobody else did what I've done. Obama didn't do it. Obama was a patsy for Russia. He was a total patsy. Look at the statement he made where he thought the mics were turned off, okay? The stupid statement he made. Nobody does a big deal about that. Getting along with President Putin, getting along with Russia is a positive, not a negative. Right. Now, with that being said, if that doesn't work out, I'll be the worst enemy he's ever had. The worst he's ever had. Trump, of course, referring to this hot mic moment in 2012. This is my last election, basically. Yeah. After my election, I have more flexibility. Yeah. Yeah. I understand. I transmit this information to Vladimir. <laughs> wow. So here we are now in a moment when Patsy, and by the way, Jesse thinks that Trump's bringing back Patsy. Bring back Patsy. It's I'm like, all for it. It's like I'm bringing sexy back, right? Is that it? <laughs> Something like that. Something yeah. like that. Thank you. But so anyway, here's a moment when lots of Americans think, boy, that was terrible what the president did in Helsinki. And he's calling the former president Patsy. Is he just, is this distraction? Is this Trump media management? Yep. And it totally worked because now we're talking about Patsy and we're not talking about the Helsinki summit. Listen, he's right. The Russians, Obama was never tough on them. Everybody knows that from Iran to Syria to Ukraine to everything, to energy. He didn't do anything until Hillary lost and then they needed an excuse to blame for her loss. So they cooked up this Russian meddling collusion thing and they tried to blame it on Trump. And there was no collusion. You know who said that? Peter Strzok, two days 
after Mueller was appointed, he wrote this to Page. There's no big there there. I wonder what he's talking about. Because he was the one that was doing all the investigating from the jump, from Jump Street, speaking of that. <laughs> and when, what Trump is basically saying in Helsinki is this. Listen, we're tough on them. We're slapping sanctions. We're closing embassies. We, you know, we're killing their mercenaries in Syria. We're doing all that. But at the same time, the ball's in their court. We can either be friends or we can be foes. And that's exactly what Hillary said. When she was Secretary of State, you know what she said, Juan? It's funny, the Internet has all this stuff out there. <laughs> she goes, our goal is to help strengthen Russia. We have to stop looking in the rearview mirror. Russia has been an ally. They've been working with us in Afghanistan. We have to stop looking backwards, look forwards, and maximize cooperation. That was Hillary Rodham Clinton saying that. And now Trump is getting burned for saying very similar thing. You know, we've had a week of absolute hysteria on this topic. And it's worth, like for me, I think there's one way to tell whether you actually care about election meddling or if you don't. If you actually care about election meddling, you should have a ton of questions for Barack Obama and his intelligence chiefs who knowingly allowed meddling to happen. They were talking about it in August, September, October of 2016. They said they knew Russia was meddling. They did nothing. Barack Obama even told his cyber people to stand down. And like you said, it was only after Donald Trump somehow won this election, that all of a sudden it became this real big hula blue. But, but if you Molly, actually didn't they care go about election meddling. Didn't they go to Senator McConnell and say, Senator McConnell, we don't want it to seem as if we're taking sides with the Democrat right. here. So, so Senator McConnell, let's do it. And Senator McConnell said, no. Yeah, they wanted, they wanted a, a statement that means nothing. What I'm talking oh. about is if you actually think this is a big deal and you're not just using it as a way to go after Donald Trump, mm -hmm. you should be demanding accountability commissions for the previous president and those intelligence chiefs. And if you're not doing that, I think that says everything we need to know, which yeah. is you don't actually think it was that big of a deal because actually so well, it wasn't Katie, the big news yesterday was Dan Coats the de uh, director of national intelligence he's in an interview out in Colorado and he right. says I, I he, Trump is gonna meet with Putin I don't know about that and then they say hey what about the meeting that he already had do you know what happened in the meeting uh, no I don't know this is the director of national intelligence doesn't that alarm you look no President Trump does things like a CEO he makes decisions and he expects the people who work for him including Dan Coats to catch up in due time you know, he can make his own decisions about whether he's going to continue to meet with Putin, whether he's not, as we saw in that soundbite, he's going to continue to meet with him because there are other issues besides Russian meddling that are very serious global issues on the table that we need to deal with. In terms of the context here, Rebecca Heinrich is a, a analyst at the Hudson Institute. She pointed out today that in 2010, President Obama hosted the former Russian president, Dmitry Medvedev, and said, or, and, you know, he said we need more flexibility. They rode in the beast together to go get a, a lunch in Washington, D.C. That same year, the NASDAQ was found to have malware on it that was capable of taking out the entire NASDAQ. And yet, we had the president of the United States still meeting with the Russian president. Um, moving forward, I know the White House has had some problems clarifying exactly what happened this week. I think that they've finally come to you know, a good explanation of, of what they're going to do moving forward. Uh, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo is moving forward on the North Korean front. President Trump has said that Russia is helping with that issue. There are bigger issues now that we need to move forward with. And finally, Congress about a month ago was supposed to show up at a briefing held by Homeland Security Secretary uh, Kirsten Nielsen and FBI Director Christopher Wray. Out of 400 plus congressmen, guess how many showed up? Less than 100. And it was all about Russian meddling. It was all about preventing this from ha so, you know, happening in the future. So if they're really concerned, as Molly said, they would be showing up to these seminars wondering what could be done so they could then go back to their constituents and say, this is what we're doing to make sure your votes are secured in November. So now we go to the walking version of the Merriam-Webster. Greg, Greg, how do you define Patsy? Uh -huh. uh, well, I love Patsy Klein. So, Patsy? Uh, Is that pasty uh, or what, Patsy? Patsy. She Patsy. was one of the greatest, probably the greatest singers of all Oh, time. I agree. I follow the pieces. Is that Patsy Klein? Yes. Yes, okay. Uh, I think um, before you meet with uh, crazy, uh, that could describe after, a lot of things. After <laughs> you know, midnight. Um, I didn't prepare, prepare much for the show today, but I'm going to go <laughs> and to make a stab at this. Trump did the right thing. Before you meet with Russia, you build up your military. You enlarge the stick, and then you go, hey, check out this carrot. Yummy, yummy, yummy. That's what he did. The left tends to do the reverse. They, hate, they say, hey, here's our bag of carrots. We'll put it on a pallet. So we'll give you 50 billion carrots, and then will you be nice to us? You, the, the point is, Trump is saying, ah, oh, we deal with them. If it doesn't work out, it doesn't work, work out, and then I kill him. That's basically what he said. If it doesn't work out with, with Putin, I'll kill him. He says, I'll be the worst enemy ever. That's what you do. Anyway, <laughs> what people are, ta people are really talking about, which I love, is the second summit. 
That is the it's like it's like so the media is is freaking out. They are losing their poop. And he says, you know what? The thing that bothered you, I'm going to do it again. I'm going to do it here. Maybe we'll have it at Miralago on Christmas. We'll throw a parade. He, the media freaks out over X. And Trump says, mm, X squared. How about that? I, wonder, I admire that. I wonder if he was in San Francisco when he did that. <laughs> That's the best place to do it. Is that yeah. right? All right. So, folks, the NFL, are they dropping the ball by calling timeout? on the national anthem policy they recently instituted. We're going to have a fiery debate about this when it's first and ten at the five next. Well, talk about a major fumble, another one. The NFL is putting its new national anthem policy on hold. The Players Union and the league announcing they're freezing the rules for now while the two sides try to resolve the issue. This comes after the Miami Dolphins reportedly said they want to punish players who protest the flag on the field by slapping them with potential fines and suspensions. Is the league heading for another PR disaster. Greg, I'm sure you care a lot about this. I thought I, I, I hate this topic, but uh, this is a massive multi-billion dollar industry and this conflict is now a childish game of who gets the last word. So we know this is not going to end. The players should wake up. This isn't your free time. This is your business and you're paid handsomely in this business. However, there is a solution because I've changed my mind. Trump should get involved with this. He's met with North Korea. He's met with Putin. He'll probably meet with Iran. <laughs> So why doesn't he look inward? I have been of the philosophy, supporting Trump in this, that you talk to everyone. Why doesn't he get the most outspoken leaders in this, whether it's Black Lives Matter or even Colin Kaepernick, get them together and actually have a meeting and, and, and invite Kanye and, act, and invite Dennis Rodman and have a, a discussion about it? Because I guarantee you he will make more progress because he has this peculiar optimism about everything he does. He thinks that when he became president, that everything that failed before, I'm going to do it. So why doesn't he direct that unusual, unbridled optimism on this, on this turgid problem that seems to drag everybody down? That, he, that could be really or maybe positive. it's because he, he called them SOBs. I agree. Oh. I agree. But he that could change. A it's not now it's time oh, to be out there. Yeah, there. parents. <laughs> But I must say that there's a real issue here in that the Players Association was not consulted by the league before they implemented the policy. And the, the policy was to have the teams regulate any response, any p punishment for kneeling. Yeah. But, I mean, this is the, the, these are the same owners who won't hire Colin Kaepernick. And don't forget that Donald Trump was the one who started this. He's the one who fired up everybody. Kaepernick had been kneeling the year before. Trump saw this as a politically potent issue to attack the players, to go after them, and never address the issue of police brutality. Molly, well, is the, it all Trump's fault? Right. The NFL is like a, tr a, a truffle pig that roots out the wrong way to handle every single problem. And they did it in this, in this case, too. They've let social justice warriors kind of control all of their policy. They did, Donald Trump did not start this. This started by alienating fans. And they let this go on. And it's been causing a lot of problems, not just in the terms of fans not showing up to games or just losing interest. They have a real epidemic on their hands. And it's not getting any better. You're right. They should have consulted with the Players Association. Someone should deal with this. It's, it's actually not a bad idea to have some kind of summit. And calling some of these players SOBs is nothing compared to what Donald Trump called Kim Jong-un, and they were able to meet together. <laughs> so, some, so maybe this is the way to handle so, it. So, Jesse, it's, the, the players, were, the what players were given an option. They were, it was be on the field. If you're going to be on the field, you stand for the national anthem. You don't kneel, you don't sit. If you don't want to do that, you can stay in the locker room. Teams will then decide how they punish each of them. The Jets were saying they're not going to punish uh, players for kneeling on the field, whereas the Miami Dolphins were going to do a four-game suspension. Seems like a fair way to handle the, the situation. I don't know. I thought it was kind of a half-baked situation. It kind of reminds me of Congress. You let a problem fester, and then you try to tackle it, and you upset both sides, and the deal falls apart, and then your favorability nosedives. It's exactly what happened here. My solution... I guess me, I would call it love, but my solution would be tough love. I would say this. I would say we're all going to stand on the field for the national anthem as a team because we play as a team. And if you don't like to do that, if you want to not be a team member, you're going to get suspended for the next game because fines don't work, the players are too rich, and the owners are too rich. And I think my source from the NFL said this. The bottom line, the owners are scared 
of the players and the media branding them as old, rich, racist, yep. white guys. Is that, already was, done your, that? Was, the was your source Donald Trump? No. <laughs> oh, that sounds the, like was a Trump the mascot thing. for the Redskins? <laughs> <laughs> no, no right, that's the well, Washington football team. Oh, that's right. <laughs> All right. Well, the NFL preseason starts August 2nd, and the regular season starts September 6th, so they don't have long to figure it out. But moving along to a different sports arena, now you can cry foul on unruly parents who go bonkers at their kids' sporting events. Find out how next. And you can act real rude and totally removed And I can act like an imbecile And say, we can dance, we can dance Everything's out of control We can dance down and We've all seen embarrassing videos of out-of-control parents brawling at their kids' sporting events. Well now, a frustrated youth soccer referee is blowing the whistle on adults behaving badly at games by creating a Facebook page to shame them. The point of the videos is to make people understand, and, and this has happened, when you're on video and you're caught acting like a fool, or what we call a cheeseburger, um, you realize <laughs> you've made a butt of yourself and you tend to change the dynamics of your behavior. And that's all we're looking for. My my parents never came to any of my sporting events, Aww. but um, I had friends whose parents actually did behave in out-of-control fashion and got kicked out of events. One of my colleagues was coach of his daughter's game, and uh, he was always worried that the parents were going to beat him up after the games. So is this, like, really a new thing, or do you think this is something that's just... Uh, we're seeing more of it because people actually have videos of it. I think we probably just see more of it. I love that he calls the out-of-control parents cheeseburgers. <laughs> yeah. I think that's fantastic, uh, even though cheeseburgers are yummy and good, so I don't know if that actually <laughs> applies to these parents but acting inappropriately. What, what, cheeseburger? I don't know. Oh. I think they just made up the name. Um, look, parents have always, not all parents, some parents have acted badly, and the thing that I like about this is when you see yourself on video acting badly, you, you really see how embarrassing you're being, and when you're at a youth game, it's about the kids, and you're really making it all about yourself, and you need to lead by example. We like good sportsmanship on the field and in the stands. Doesn't it also maybe incentivize people to actually act out, knowing that they can get it captured on video and, and become, they can make a name for themselves, or no? I think shame is a powerful weapon to change behavior. Um, <laughs> I was shamed it as, as a you. youth. Well, you should have seen what I'd be like without shame. Uh, I like that show, To Catch a Predator, and I think uh, that has had a profound effect on society because look at these animals that come in thinking they're going to have sex with some youth, and they put their whole face on network television. They'll never make that mistake again, and then wannabe well, sexual predators will never make that mistake again either. So I think this is good. Wait a second. Wait a second. How is this like sexual? Predator. Not an exact analogy, but the shame <laughs> function, I think, wow. is very true. Okay, okay. Well, I, I, think, I think the bigger problem, I think the reason for these videos, Molly, is that this guy was a, a youth referee, youth sport referee, and he was getting threats and assaulted, and his family has to hide out after the game, and he just said, you know, these parents are out of control. And so that's why he's doing it. He is doing it to shame them. Yeah. Uh, but I don't think it's like that other thing you're talking well, not about. As, not as strong. And there's there are consequences, too, outside of just the sporting event, right? Like if your employer sees that you're at this game fighting with someone, they probably aren't going to be very happy with your behavior. So th that's a consequence that's, of action as well. The, the issue here, and let's not forget, we're creating a nation of narcs. <laughs> and, I, and, I, and I hate narcs. We all have bad days. Let's say you had a rough day at work and you're forced to go see your awful kid play soccer. <laughs> kids playing soccer, there's nothing more tedious and awful. And kids in general doing nothing are terrible to watch. So now they're playing a sport that's awful. So you're, you just work like eight or nine hours and you got to go see your kid pretend to be happy. But then you got to look at everybody else's kids who are terrible. And, you know, you've been, maybe you had a few drinks. <laughs> You know, maybe yeah. you brought like a flask yeah. and you just notice these kids are terrible and you start, it's, everybody can have a bad day and now we're always filming people when they have a bad day and it's not fair. We've got to stop being narcs. I do think that's true. Everybody has their bad days. However, when you're watching your kids play, you probably shouldn't be fighting other parents. Like, Why not? It's more interesting. Like that, that, <laughs> that stuff you were playing, the film you were playing, let's be honest, that's more interesting than soccer. It's
Kid soccer is dull, but the brawls, they're interesting. I mean, I got hit in the face with the soccer ball a lot. I'm sure that was very entertaining for everybody watching. I went to my godchildren's lacrosse game, and they actually weren't even keeping score, so oh, I decided oh, to boring. keep score. That's a whole Shout story. it out. I'm that's sure I'd be on segment. one of these. <laughs> anyway, stay right there. Fan Mail Friday is next. Uh, Talica. How's that? <laughs> Sam Mail Friday. We should have just played that whole song. All right. This is a great question. This is from Robert. All right, Jesse, you ready for this? No. Something tells me you do do this. Do you ever <laughs> no. return food at a restaurant? No, I'm actually a real wimp when it comes to yeah. being at a restaurant. If they mess up my steak, I will never turn up. I don't have guts. Mm -hmm. I, I become a shrinking violet at a restaurant. Oh, really? Yeah, I, feel, I, I don't know why. I don't feel very much in control at a restaurant. It's, I a, feel it's like... from watching To Catch a Predator. It's affected you. <laughs> it has. Yeah, you, you have a problem with kitchens. I'm rattled. <laughs> Even restaurant kitchens wait, scare wait, you. Wait, wait. Is that because of who you are? You think that people will say, oh, you oh, know very deferential to service people because I once was a bellhop. Yeah. So I respect people that serve me. Uh, I think to uh, to too much of a degree. And you still uh, wear the I hat. Give them too much deference and respect. <laughs> <laughs> Only on the weekends. <laughs> I'm working two jobs, like Cortez said. <laughs> exactly, Molly. Do you ever return food at a restaurant? Absolutely not. I, I was a waitress. I've worked at places where nobody would have ever done anything inappropriate. But I'm nervous enough about it. I know enough that. I just don't oh, want anybody. They, I don't want. No, I, do. I don't want anyone messing with my food. Because that's what they do, Out right? of anger. Oh, I've, heard, I've heard stories. I read that in Anthony Bourdain's book. You know, mm -hmm. so I don't. I, I. What do you think? Oh, I. I will. If they don't do it the right way, like I'm paying you money for this, you're getting it back. Oh, sorry, not sorry. Why? Like, oh, and I always I tip horse. really well. Always for people who do a good job, and I don't tip very well for people who don't have a good, do a good job and who don't have a good oh. attitude. Because if I save the tip money for those who do well, then I don't have to I'm tip everybody of equally. Want a foodie? Yeah, I love food. So you. But the other day, I actually returned some food. So this question is just the right time for me because I, I generally don't bother. I just like yeah. eat. But uh, I was sitting at the bar and I said I'd like a piece of swordfish. I just want all I wanted. Yeah. The guy brought me salmon. Ah. And then I said, Hey, I ordered swordfish. And he said, Oh man, my mistake. And he took it back. So no, I would just yeah, eat the polite salmon. about it. Yeah, I would say, You know what? It's Very fine. Polite. I'll just have the salmon. You know, I return. I return food, but only if it's too good because I feel I don't deserve it. <laughs> yeah. I'll I don't just go, believe that. This is, this is too all. delicious. No. Oh, all the time. It happens all the time. No. All right. Instagram question from Frenchy Firecracker. Ah, interesting. Wonder how you got that name. If you could invent a new phone app, what would it be, Juan? What would be the new phone app? I think it would do poetry. <laughs> Automatic poetry for whatever situation I was in in my life. Because already, the, 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 I can get in my car, it tells me how long it's going to take me to get from Fox News to church yeah. on Sunday morning. So I want an app that just says, hey, you know what, you're in an interesting situation. Here's the piece of poetry you could read to Jesse. That's actually, you know what? A poetry app is not a bad, you could plug in any kind of situation. Yes. Like you could say rutabagas, yes. and there'll be a poem about rutabagas. Shakespeare did one year. It could ago. be like a rap thing. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Katie? You know, I don't know. What no. kind of app would I create? There's already apps for traffic. I'm sure there are apps for telling you when the trains aren't running that, on that time. I, I, have, I already have an idea for an app. But you, nothing I that really, bothers I you? I really don't so have when you think an about idea for an app. For everything, like you, to get you anywhere. I think one that would be useful, and this is what the mm. theme of the show, someone that lets you know, uh, something that lets you know where you can go to the restroom mm. in a crowded city. No, they have yeah. one. They oh, do. Really? Yeah, they do. Call? There you go. Yeah, it's yeah. called San Francisco. <laughs> Done. One. Yes. Crapping on his own people. <laughs> Literally, figuratively. Yeah. Jesse. I mean, this is a slam dunk. A Waters World app. You just get oh, everything yeah. from the show, from my history. Boom, boom, boom. It's all there in one place. I have a okay, so I have a genius app. It tells you the best place to put on your shoes. I spend so much time <laughs> in my apartment and in hotels. Trying to find the right level of height so that I can comfortably put on my shoes. And I end up being a short man sitting on the floor like the little kid putting my shoes on. I don't like doing that. I, so I, I think that problem too. everybody has the shoe putting on problem except for women. Men don't like to talk about this because of the shame. The shame of not being able to put your shoes on. What? Anyway. What is going what? on?
plane is going through this and that. I have those dreams. Right. The so plane crash dreams. Yeah, I don't, oh, it's not good. Yeah, it's not good. Not good. What about you? The weirdest place I've had to sleep is on a train from Munich to Rome, and it was supposed to be a sleeper train, and they stop every 10 minutes to pick people up, and the door is just slamming in and out, random people coming in, criminals probably. It was a little weird. Strangest place for you to sleep? A bed. <laughs> A flower bed. Oh. Yes, you didn't see that one coming. One more thing is up next. Oka Talica. How's that? <laughs> Sam Mail Friday. We should have just played that whole song. All right. This is a great question. This is from Robert. All right, Jesse, you ready for this? No. Something tells me you do do this. Do you ever <laughs> no. return food at a restaurant? No, I'm actually a real wimp when it comes to yeah. being at a restaurant. If they mess up my steak, I will never turn it. I don't have guts. Mm -hmm. I, I become a shrinking violet at a restaurant. Oh, really? Yeah, I, feel, I, I don't know why. I don't feel very much in control at a restaurant. It's, I a, feel it's like... from watching To Catch a Predator. It's affected you. <laughs> it has. Yeah, you, you have a problem with kitchens. I'm rattled. <laughs> Even restaurant kitchens wait, scare wait, you. Wait, wait. Is that because of who you are? You think that people will say, oh, you oh, know. Very deferential to service here. people because I once was a bellhop. Yeah. So I respect people that serve me. Uh, I think to uh, too, too much of a degree. And you still uh, wear the I hat. Give them too much deference and respect. <laughs> <laughs> Only on the weekends. <laughs> I'm working two jobs, like Cortez said. <laughs> exactly, Molly. Do you ever return food at a restaurant? Absolutely not. I, I was a waitress. I've worked at places where nobody would have ever done anything inappropriate. But I'm nervous enough about it. I know enough that. I just don't oh, want anybody. They, I don't want. No, I, do. I don't want anyone messing with my food. Because that's what they do, Out right? of anger. Oh, I've, I heard, I've heard stories. I read that in Anthony Bourdain's book. You know, mm -hmm. so I don't. I, I. What do you think? Oh, I. I will. If they don't do it the right way, like I'm paying you money for this, you're getting it back. Oh, sorry, not sorry. Why? Like, oh, and I always I tip horse. really well. Always for people who do a good job, and I don't tip very well for people who don't have a good, do a good job and who don't have a good attitude. Oh. Because if I save the tip money for those who do well, then I don't have to I'm tip everybody of equally. Want a foodie? Yeah, I love food. So you. But the other day, I actually returned some food. So this question is just the right time for me because I, I generally don't bother. I just like yeah. eat. But uh, I was sitting at the bar and I said I'd like a piece of swordfish. I just want all I wanted. Yeah. The guy brought me salmon. Ah. And then I said, Hey, I ordered swordfish. And he said, Oh man, I, my mistake. And he took it back. So no, I would just very eat the polite salmon. about it. Yeah, I would yeah. say, You know what? It's very fine. Polite. I'll just have the salmon. You know, I return. I return food, but only if it's too good because I feel I don't deserve it. <laughs> yeah. I'll I don't just believe go, this that. Is, this at is too all. delicious. No. Oh, all the time. It happens all the time. No. All right. Instagram question from Frenchy Firecracker. Ah, interesting. Want to know how you got that name? If you could invent a new phone app, what would it be, Juan? What would be the new phone app? I think it would do poetry. <laughs> Automatic poetry for whatever situation I was in in my life. Because already, the, 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 I can get in my car, it tells me how long it's gonna take me to get from Fox News to church yeah. on Sunday morning. So I want an app that just says, hey, you know what, you're in an interesting situation. Here's the piece of poetry you could read to Jesse. That's actually, you know what? A poetry app is not a bad, you could plug in any kind of situation. Yes. Like you could say rutabagas, yes. and there'll be a poem about rutabagas. Shakespeare did one year. It could ago. be like a rap thing. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Katie? You know, I don't know. What no. kind of app would I create? There's already apps for traffic. I'm sure there are apps for telling you when the trains aren't running that, on that time. I, I, have, I already have an idea for an app. But you, nothing I that really, bothers I you? I really don't so have you think an about idea for an app. For everything, like you, to get you anywhere. I think one that would be useful, and this is what the mm. theme of the show, someone that lets you know, uh, something that lets you know where you can go to the restroom mm. in a crowded city. No, they have yeah. one. They oh, do. Really? Yeah, What's they it do. Called? Yeah, it's yeah. called San Francisco. <laughs> Done. One. Yes. Crapping on his own people. <laughs> Literally, figuratively. Yeah. Jesse. I mean, this is a slam dunk. A Waters World app. You just get oh, everything yeah. from the show, from my history. Boom, boom, boom. It's all there in one place. I have a genius. Okay, so I have a genius app. It tells you the best place to put on your shoes. I spend so much time <laughs> in my apartment and in hotels. Trying to find the right level of height so that I can comfortably put on my shoes. And I end up being a short man sitting on the floor like the little kid putting my shoes on. I don't like doing that. I so I think that problem too. everybody has the shoe putting on problem except for women. Men don't like to talk about this because of the shame. The shame of not being able to put your shoes on. 
What? Anyway, what is going what? on? plane is going through this and that i have those dreams right the so plane crash dreams yeah I don't, oh, it's not good yeah not it's good. not good what about you the weirdest place i've had to sleep is on a train from munich to rome and it was supposed to be a sleeper train and they stop every 10 minutes to pick people up and the door just slamming in and out random people coming in criminals probably it was a little weird strangest place for me to sleep a bed <laughs> <laughs> a flower bed. <laughs> yes, you didn't see that one coming. One more thing is up next. Hello, everybody. I'm Jesse Waters, along with Katie Pavlich, Juan Williams, Molly Hemingway, and Greg Gutfeld. It's 5 o'clock in New York City, and this is The Five. Socialists teaming up to bring their message to the heartland. Senator Bernie Sanders is hitting the campaign trail in Kansas with the new face of big government liberalism. You know, we must have gotten off at the wrong stop because people told me that Kansas was a Republican state. Does it look like that today? We are going to come together to transform this country politically and economically. We want to be a nation that, that allows improved and expanded Medicare for all. We are a nation that will not stop until every child is born with the opportunity to go to college or trade school free of cost. Meanwhile, Senator Elizabeth Warren is pushing the left's new fake news narrative about jobs. When people are working at minimum wage jobs that won't support them or they're working two, three or four jobs to try to pay the rent and keep food on the table, then simply saying the unemployment figures have gone down just doesn't get you there. What she forgot to mention is that the Trump economy is booming and there are more jobs available than people to fill them. All right, Greg, let's start with uh, Cortez teaming up with Bernie. I love it. I mean, this is a big threat to the Democrat establishment. It's like you got the old communists, you got the new communists. It's like the Snoopy and Woodstock of <laughs> socialism. Think about it. The greatest economic system known to mankind is the one that the Democratic Party is rejecting, despite evidence that it's worked to eliminate poverty and disease all over the world, wherever it's introduced. And yet they pick the one that wherever it's introduced destroys Countries, Venezuela, uh, Cuba, USSR before it became Russia, even, even cities in California, San Francisco, uh, because I would say because of big government is now the nation's restroom. You can have a seat anywhere, no flushing needed. So I think, uh, I think uh, go for it all the way. I, and also, I think they make, they're, they're a great team. They're like, a, they're like a buddy cop show. They're like a buddy cop socialist show. They do look good together, I have to admit. Juan, socialists aren't very good at math. Let's just be honest. I mean, she wants free college, free housing, free health care. Who is going to pay for all this? Oh, gee, I wonder. Maybe it's the same people who are paying for the Trump tax cut that blew up the deficit. You think that could be just oh, all funded by crumbs? Oh, is that the that's it. So in other words, it's OK when Trump blows up the deficit and spends a lot of money. But if you start taking care of us, the American people, and most Americans think we need some kind of Affordable Care Act, we should take care of people who have pre-existing conditions. I thought conditions. we had an affordable care. Affordable. Oh, who's who's, affordable who's care. trying to undo it? it? Oh, it's your side. It's your side. It's unaffordable very affordable. Mm -hmm. By the no. way, Greg, we're not talking about communism. Is that what you said? Communism? I will say they're communists. Okay. Socialist communists. You call, you know, tomato, yeah. tomato. Well, I see. But what about the idea that we in the United States are a country that, in fact, puts in place taxes. We somewhat restrain unfettered capitalism because guess what you know there's sometimes a need for a safety net well bernie sanders style socialism is communism let's not forget that he's the one who used to praise bread lines uh, in south america as an example of how government is actually working for the people as people are starving standing in line waiting for the little crumb literally that the government is going to give them i love that elizabeth warren is trying to argue that you know people are trying to work three or four jobs just to earn a living when democrats and socialists and their 
Party have made it impossible for regular everyday Americans to make a living by implementing minimum wage laws, which have now turned places like McDonald's, where people get their first step in, into robotic institutions where you order from a machine rather than a teenager who can then go on and, and get a good job in life. They are also the, the same party who has implemented things like occupational licensing. You have to have a per Socialists teaming up to bring their message to the heartland. Senator Bernie Sanders is hitting the campaign trail in Kansas with the new face of big government liberalism. You know, we must have gotten off at the wrong stop because people told me that Kansas was a Republican state. Does it look like that today? We are going to come together to transform this country politically and economically.